Hello and welcome to another episode of El Hangueo. Today we are joined by a very special, high achieving power babe of the Latino community, Lili Gil Valeta, who is here to talk to us about what it's like to be a woman in business. And not only that, a woman of color in business who has essentially done it um, on her own, obviously with the success and support of community, but very much as a self-made woman, which isn't celebrated enough. So Lily, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Bessie, for having me. Of course. So just so uh, whoever is watching can get a little taste of mm -hmm. your history and where you're from, you are also fully bilingual in Spanish, um, which I find awesome that you have zero <laughs> accent because oftentimes when I speak in Spanish, people are like, whoa, you speak Spanish and you speak English without an accent. It's like, yes, we do exist. Um, <laughs> so I, I feel like, you know, if we're Latinos that don't speak Spanish, that's, that's, oh my gosh, how could you? If we're Latinos that speaks English with an accent, oh my God, how could you? If we're Latinos that speak Spanish with an accent, oh my God, how could you? You know, there's no <laughs> win. So tell us a little bit about your history and about your background, please. In English, yes. Spanish, whatever you want. In, in Spanglish, como quieras. No, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Pessy, uh, for having me and for creating this space. I think we need to do this more. So kudos to you and what you're doing, because these are the stories we got to share. A lot of people see the resume or the title or what's on a bio, but there's a story behind the story. And many times it has ups and downs and all kinds of things in it. So in my case, my story, um, you know, begins in Colombia because I am from Colombia. It, my whole family is still in Colombia, by the way. Um, and in the early 90s, so I'm dating myself when I was 17, um, my parents gave me the great opportunity, which I never thought I was going to get, um, to come to the U.S. So with a lot of sacrifice, hard work, they said, you know what, how about you go to the States and do an ESL program? Mm -hmm. So I wasn't coming to go to college or to stay. It was like, this very specific mission, okay, let's ship her off to learn English <laughs> and then come back. And this was the early 90s, right? When Colombia at the time, unfortunately, was going through a lot of uh, what you see in Narcos, which is not Colombia right now, for the record. <laughs> that has changed a lot. But anyway, so I ended up in Texas, of all places in America, as my home when I landed with my suitcase and my student visa. Um, and um, I went to a very small uh, Christian school in Keene, Texas. I mean, literally the city has 6,000 people in its population. And now that I'm a mom, I understand why they would send me to a teeny place like this when you're shipping off your daughter to <laughs> another country. I probably would do the same. But anyway, so the school is called uh, Southwestern Adventist University. And there's a big reason why I'm mentioning the full name because fast forward now, I'm super involved with them. So we'll save that for later. But um, yeah, I went to Southwestern. I stayed there for my full year of English. Then was like, wait, I want to stay. This is great. So I ended up staying and graduated undergrad from a very small uh, little private Christian school. So a lot of people get stressed out with where you begin. Mm -hmm. Or oh my gosh, do I need to go to some big university somewhere? Uh, it's not about where you start is where the journey takes you and what you make of it. And in my case, uh, from there, I went on to get a great job offer because I was always the best student and super loud and proud and all that eventually when I learned English. And I moved to Florida and my first real big girl job was uh, super fun because it was when Walt Disney and Florida Hospital had a joint venture for creating what's like the hospital of the future in Disney properties in Orlando. It's called Celebration Health. Um, so I was there and I think that's where I fell in love also with like the future of healthcare. Um, and B, I was there, then started doing my MBA at Rollins College, which is one, a great university in Orlando. And then I got stolen by a recruiter from Johnson & Johnson who <laughs> saw me in action. 
Um, and anyway, so then I went to do the interviews and I got this great offer with J and J and I had a 10 year career there as a corporate executive. At some point I became the youngest highest ranking executive for the work I was doing in global marketing. Um, always working really hard, giving my best, a total nerd of the numbers. Um, and then that took me into becoming an entrepreneur, which I think we're going to get to that in a second. So I don't want to stretch too long my answer, but as you see, ESL, very small school in the middle of nowhere in Texas, then big kind of first corporate opportunity, got my MBA and really made j and &J my platform for thriving and growing and pushing myself and seeing that I wanted to be this C-suite executive in corporate America as my title that I was chasing, maybe to a fault. Uh, but it gave me a lot of, you know, opportunity to demonstrate that I could rise above yeah. what people thought of, about me being young or an immigrant or whatever. I was like, let me prove you're wrong. And always gave it my best. The silver lining throughout your story is that it took community to get you there. And it took a fact that your parents wanted you to have something better for your safety and your mm -hmm. progress. Uh, your school nurtured you, you know, and then you went on to work in a place that, you know, acknowledged and valued you because at the time I am sure you were probably, if not the only woman there, the only woman of color that spoke Spanish. Yes. And yes. as you know, now being bilingual is an asset in any mm -hmm. job. But back then, we have so many fellow Latinos that didn't learn to speak Spanish because their parents were afraid to teach them Spanish, right? Because the, That's right. the goal was, you're in America, learn English. Forget mm -hmm. about all your roots. Forget about everything. You are American now. And now right. when they are, you know, I'm, I'm in my 30s and time and time again, every job that I have is looking for that bilingual aspect. And so now we really recognize how treasured our roots and our languages are and mm -hmm. you know what i like from you and, and how i've come to to know of you is that you pay it forward right you don't yeah. forget about that aspect of community as you left johnson and johnson and you mm -hmm. ventured on your own what was that like because you had to yeah. start from zero and build yourself a team right yep. so yep. how did that feel and how did you find your community? So even, even before I, I answer that, Bessie, I want to acknowledge what you just said about community. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, there's so many sayings out there. I even say, hey, if, if I don't have a seat at the table, I'm going to make up my own table. <laughs> and I think I did that even since college. Mm -hmm. um, so we can wait for others to invite us into community or we all have the capacity to build human connections with at least one extra person outside of yourself. Hello, everybody could do that, I hope. Um, and that in itself is community because it becomes the kind of, you know, camaraderie of whether it is a deep friendship or a mentor or somebody. So I was without knowing I was building community. Now I play back the tape. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I did in college, uh, creating like the, the, the business club, right? This is before entrepreneurship was so hot and everybody mm -hmm. has it in colleges, but I kind of had my own version of that of students in free enterprise. Mm -hmm. And it was like a group and I, I, I kind of volunteered to bring us together and create projects and do stuff in the community. Um, and that wasn't in existence, but you kind of spark that little thing. And then when I was at J and J, um, I noticed there was like a women's leadership group, almost like one of those networks. Now everybody has one and yeah. resource groups. Well, I asked the question, I'm like, do we have a Latino group? Like, do we even know how many Hispanics are around? Mm -hmm. Like, can we create something? Well, I was one of the founders of OLA, the Employee Resource Group for Johnson & Johnson, which this year is having its 20-year anniversary, and I'm going to be in the 20-year anniversary celebration with everybody. 
how the heck did I transition from what anyone would look at from the outside and be like, Lily, are you out of your crazy mind leaving J&J mm -hmm. when you are slated to be this super high ranking executive and there's not a lot of us, right? I did have some of my Latino friends inside change. It's like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. We need us in positions mm -hmm. like you have here. A lot of, but there was a bigger bug of purpose that bit me instead of chasing titles. But this is what nobody knows, Bessie. I'm going to give you the backstory. <laughs> I had, there was two beautiful things in parallel. The platform that Ola gave me that I created, remember, mm -hmm. inside j, j allowed me to lead projects or initiatives that were not in my job title. Mm -hmm. So for the first time ever in the pharmaceutical sector of j, j I was the one raising up the question of what are we doing to reach diverse patients, Hispanic and Black patients who are more affected by diabetes or HIV, a lot of the conditions that J&J &J has therapies and medicines for. And because that wasn't my day job doing multicultural marketing, but I had enough power and a voice of a loud Latina to say so, um, I put it on the radar as an OLA initiative. <laughs> So I'm like, all right, fine. It doesn't exist. So we're going to create it and make it up. And that inspires me to start looking at the numbers and paying attention at the fact that there was going to be these shifting demographics mm -hmm. that uh, if business leaders didn't pay attention, they were going to miss out. And I was doing this kind of analysis and work, I mean, almost two decades ago. Now everybody's talking about it. I'm like, okay, this is not new. It's been there. It's just you haven't been paying attention. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, so it's creating, leveraging the power of our OLA community to bring us together towards a common goal of putting our market at the center of business decisions because nobody else had thought about it. And that gave me the idea to create the company that I couldn't find to hire that would be an expert in this. But here's what nobody knows. At the very same time when this was happening and it looked so bright and beautiful in my career, I was um, going through a divorce mm -hmm. and my mom had been diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer, and eventually we lost her to cancer. So it's very interesting how when adversity hits you, you can either let it sink you or motivate you to change or transform or like elevate. And I don't know if I would have had the guts to leave what on paper, rightfully so, looked like an amazing career yeah. if it wasn't because I had higher, bigger things than title and a job pushing me to rethink everything about life yeah. from my personal life and my mom and all of it. And that is why I said, you know what? I have a bigger purpose here. Mm -hmm. I've been working so hard that it even impacted my marriage because I think about now, you know, my ex-husband then, I wouldn't want to be married to me either because <laughs> I was always working mm -hmm. and traveling and it's just being absent all the time. Mm -hmm. And so all of that makes you realize and rethink what is life about? Um, and the biggest force for any entrepreneur to me is purpose because if you're just chasing money and title it will always leave you dissatisfied it's yeah. never enough it's unfulfilling and that was the only way I had the cojones to literally leave a high ranking position in a great company because I saw I could do this for more than one company mm -hmm. and impact the world in a different way so that they could see the power of our markets mm -hmm. for the long haul. And that was the impetus. And Ola was an inspiration for me to be able to see that as my tribe and my community. And then when I went out into the world was my business partner who was a former Johnson & Johnson exec as well, left and drank the Kool-Aid with me and we started um, 
but it was very scary. It was, I, I felt insecure mm -hmm. because to that point, people were inviting me to panels and speaking engagements and big things and awards because I was Lily from J and J. But how would my identity change if I was no longer Lily from J and J? So you kind of get this little imposter syndrome to mm -hmm. kick in. And I was like, it doesn't matter. I'm not chasing title. We're going to do this and start transforming corporations to see the power of our markets. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the force that kind of pushed me to be able to do that transition. Um, funny enough, J&J &J now is one of my clients. So we're working <laughs> together again. <laughs> so it's full circle. Um, but anyhow, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. I, went, I went deeper than you probably were thinking, but I feel for those that are watching, yeah. um, when things happen to you, they don't happen to you. They may happen for you. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was my mom's health matters as well as my personal life and my own marriage in trouble that made me rethink what did God put me here to do on this earth and reshuffle. And that gives you a different courage that I think otherwise you couldn't find to do this kind of crazy stuff. Yeah. And, you know, hearing of your trajectory, I think that we are so maybe less so nowadays because everybody's mm -hmm. so mobile globally, but yeah. people are still so concerned about, you know, their next big step and their next big choice and having, you know, a steady career. And if mm -hmm. you have less than two years in a job, it's seen as a failure, you know, when in reality, if you see opportunity, you should be able to put things in a balance and really analyze is this worth it or what's the worst that could happen if I do it right yeah. and so you take that chance and I think that's the moral of the story because you had a stable trajectory and exactly like you said you know you're just like what is my purpose what am I doing and I think it was very courageous for you at that moment to say okay yeah let's do this because a lot mm -hmm. of us don't dare right that's and at right. least at the end of the day you can say I did it which, which honestly, even if it's a failure, even if it's a success, the fact that you can say I did it is what feels the best. But tell us a little bit about your companies now, because it's not just one right now you have yeah. another company, you have multiple clients and explain to us what it is that you do mm -hmm. and how is it as still one of the few women in the you know tech marketing business industry mm -hmm. leading these companies yeah yeah so yeah I uh we took purpose into action <laughs> and a vision that now has you know we have uh employees all over the world mm -hmm. and work with some of the biggest brands and corporations in the world um and and it's a big privilege because I feel we're changing organizations from the inside out so what we do um, so the, the, the main company is called Cien Plus. Mm -hmm. And Cien Plus, as we know in Espanol, means 100. Uh, the inspiration for the name is because we believe very strongly that companies and corporations cannot achieve their full 100% potential in business and in growth without an inclusive approach to that business. And because of that premise, we exist to bring the data, the strategy, and the marketing that brands need to accelerate growth in today's highly diverse and changing world. Mm -hmm. So when they want to understand the market potential, the consumer insights, how to do it, and where to get started, they call us to show them the path to what we now call and have mapped out as their path to cultural intelligence. Mm -hmm. The second company is very interesting because it was incubated inside of CN. So as we kept doing this for big, big corporations, you know, our client list, I pinch myself all the time. It's like, really, we're working with Google, <laughs> with Pfizer, with Johnson & Johnson, with Prudential, with Pepsi. I mean, it just goes on and on. 
-hmm. And when I think about, oh my gosh, we're doing all this great stuff for them. The idea for a tech innovation happened. Oh my gosh, Bessie, you're getting the backstories that are so fun. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, because it, it just, I want to honor how the tech innovation happened. Um, there was a year in 2016 when we lost in one summer 60% of our revenues. Oof. It's, yeah. It was millions of dollars, um, but my, my hands just got like chicken. I know. <laughs> How are you doing that in English? Like, oh my god! But wow. I, I wish it was because we got fired or something terrible yeah. happened. Honestly, it was like the craziest thing. Um, one of our clients was going through a merger and acquisition process, and they got acquired by this other company from Minnesota. Long story short. Even everybody who was our client in New Jersey at the time in their headquarters, even all of them lost their jobs. Oof. So we were, we were collateral damage to a corporate merger on one client that was very, very big. And then literally like a month later, cover of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> this is, I can't, you can't make this stuff up. Another one of our clients, a pharmaceutical company, Valiant Pharmaceuticals, was going through this very, it was like a messy Wall Street thing, like a hostile takeover of another pharma company. And then they had to split up different divisions because it was going to be seen as a monopoly. Anyway, don't want to bore you with the details, but long story short, that other client going through that hostile takeover in Wall Street terms also went through like a merger and acquisition type of move. And we were collateral damage to that one too. All of that happened. And I looked at my partner, I got really mad and upset because we had never seen declining sales in our journey. And I'm like, selling services and consulting and knowledge sucks. <laughs> we have to change this. I don't want to depend on these crazy corporate moves and da -di da -di da da And I told them, we're going to tech enable what we do. It was this crazy, I was like, I don't want to sell knowledge. We need to create a product. Cultural intelligence cannot be just like consultant BS. It needs to have technology and data and something around it. Anyway, crazy me. I was invited to speak at a conference in October. All of this happened in June, July, August. And I said, in October, I told this to my team, when I'm on that stage, which was a big pharma healthcare conference, I'm going to announce that we're launching something new on that stage. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the, the pissed off energy of losing business like that turned and we collectively turned it into motivation mm -hmm. to pull this off. Like, okay. So what are we going to launch? How do we do it? Da, da, da. And I got introduced, this is again, I mean, providential, to the guy that today is our partner in the tech side. His name is Patrick, uh, chief data officer, super geek of that world. Um, and we got introduced to each other and he had been doing some stuff with tech and then working with us. We said, wait a second, could we do this by ethnicity, gender, generation, so we can take your AI and discover insights that are inclusive. He had never thought about it. Oh yeah, let's try it. Long story short, that October we did launch it, Culture Intel. And our tech innovation and probably one of our biggest differentiators in the market would have never been born if we hadn't lost 60% of our revenues. Mm -hmm. And when you face that kind of a loss, you either get really pissed off and crawl into a corner and fire everybody and fold the company or kind of reshake up and say, okay, how do I innovate or die? And then no, that's what we did. So Culture Intel was incubated inside of CN. And now because it's a tech platform company with its own IP and all that, then we separated it um, to kind of have it be housed in one separate legal entity. And that's why there's two, mm -hmm. the tech side, market research, using AI, big data analytics. And then there's the consultancy and marketing side of it. 
and they work with each other, but they're two separate companies. I feel that immigrants and first or second or third generation immigrants don't give up. Like that's not oh, a yeah. DNA. And, and we pass that down to our children. You know, it's just like, you are here, but you can't forget where you came from and you can't give up because yeah. you're representing, right? All of the people that came before you for you to be here right now. So sometimes that's a little bit of a pressure but mm -hmm. a lot of times it's actually that motivation that turns into that perspective of we can't give up. But That's so, exactly right. you know, the second part of, of the question is even now with two, you know, profitable companies doing what a lot of companies weren't doing 10, 20 years ago, <laughs> which is the fad now, yep. um, how is your experience as a woman in business, as a leading woman in business? Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, I want to just mention cultural intelligence, because mm -hmm. I think what you do different in your companies is not like taking advantage of Hispanic Heritage Month, right? And right. that's when you're going to launch a product in Spanish or, you know, Black History Month. And that's when you're going to launch a new hair product, you know, something like that. Yeah. You're actually informing people. This is what our community needs, wants, believes looks for etc it is a intelligence it's Correct. not just taking advantage of the market and that is mm -hmm. so so important so i wanted to put that in there because the term cultural intelligence is very purposeful yeah. um but so as a leading woman in business today after 20 years what is your experience like Oh my goodness. So I always tell the ladies that ask me about how do you do it? Like almost like if we are like an alien superhero mm -hmm. or something. No, I'm, I'm very human. And I think one of the things that is beautiful about us women, and I'm not just saying it to bash the guys, the research shows it. Uh, even the, there's a ton of work from the Harvard Kennedy School that does work on women issues that continues to validate that we are more collaborative as leaders. So we're uh, kind of fostering and motivating teams to better interact and create greatness with each other instead of creating more of this competitive us versus them. And I think that is a superpower we have. Uh, but at the same time, one thing that gives me comfort this, these days, because we have evolved as a society, is that I think and even with COVID more so, we are now um, have more permission, or at least I do that in my team, but more permission to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be Wonder Woman all the time. Um, and I think that's something that I've come to terms, you know, after, you know, in my 40s, when you become older and wiser. <laughs> um, and I realize, I feel like I have become definitely wiser uh, because. I recognize that my ability to be a great female leader starts with that empathy of collaboration that I should enable in others so that they can see their own greatness and not feel lonely in that journey of greatness. But at the same time is giving permission to be real. And that giving permission to be real is when I can tell my team that, you know, I'm not going to be able to join that afternoon because I must prioritize, you know, my kid's football game, just to say something. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that because that fulfills a part of my wholeness that would allow me to show up even more complete and fulfilled to the leadership team meeting the morning after. <laughs> As women, we, we are more open to sharing. I think before in my corporate life, I was always scared to expose vulnerability. And I think we've graduated a bit, depending on the industry it may not be as easy, but at least as a female leader, I wanna enable an environment that gives permission to that. Because I think people perform better when they know they can be their full selves as humans. And I know that that one mom that had to make a certain decision or dad it, that one afternoon, because they're so committed to the mission and we have a collaborative environment, they will probably dial back in at 10 p.m. after kids are 
asleep without me even having to ask them to do so. Because the commitment is created through a, a sense of empathy. And I feel that's a superpower that we have as female leaders if we choose to exercise it. But for those of you that are female leaders in different capacities, resist the temptation to be Wonder Woman because we cannot be 200%. Mm -hmm. There are times when I know I'm 100% an amazing business leader, entrepreneur, you know, boss, but at the same time, I'm probably being a really crappy mom, but then I flip it and maybe the day after I'm an amazing mom because I choose that priority of my 100% for XYZ reason. And I'm going to be okay that that day I may be disconnected and falling behind on my emails. But you're making those trade-offs deliberately without guilt. Yes. And that's the magic. Otherwise, I will guilt myself to death because there is something I should have done for my kids, my husband, my family, or my friends today. But hey, I am putting my 100% here and tomorrow I'll do that other 100%, but it can't be 200. It's too hard. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, it has to be. And you know what? A great partner. Um, in my case, you know, my husband is amazing. He's a business owner too. And we don't have roles set aside or anything like it is just, we know we communicate a lot. We have a calendar that we share. We compare notes often when we're laying in bed next to each other. It's like, okay, what's happening next week? Are you traveling? Am I traveling? How are we doing? And it just becomes a collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps a lot. Well, anyway. I think it's just um, the message of being true to yourself. You yes. can't deny yourself. And the more true you are to yourself and to your truths and your responsibilities, mm -hmm. and like you said, the communication that you have, the better you can perform ultimately. Because like you yeah. said, you know, you're always going to be shutting down a part of you if you're not your true self. And that's so, so important. So I'm so glad you actually yeah. were honest with that and not given, you know, the typical, oh, well, you know, it's just, I make time for everything. I wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning and I go to bed at 12 and I do everything in the day because- mm -hmm. It's, mm -mm. it's tiring. What would be words of advice, you know, looking at your trajectory mm -hmm. and knowing that they are paving their own path now, right? Um, with this incredible history of your background and his background and how you built yourself to be a self-made woman in business mm -hmm. and him to be a man in business, um, but not lose that humility that you both have. I do tell it to a lot of, especially young Latinos, he, my primos and my own kids, it's to never, ever, ever, ever forget where you come from, mm -hmm. ever. Because that gives you the clues and the essence of why you are you. And there's beauty in that, in its glories and faults. It's, it's beautiful to understand that. And then in, when you acknowledge and recognize where you come from, that should ignite a sense of purpose that ought to tie back to honoring that origin. Mm -hmm. And it's not just culture or, hey, Colombia. No, no, no. It's the origin of, in my case, the immigrant journey, the origin of acknowledging that yes there was a time when I would go to my dorm room every day and cry because I couldn't speak English and people were misinterpreting me and they thought I was shy and not as smart or whatever um, and when you acknowledge that which ultimately is the power of empathy but empathy with your own story and those that came before you which should then inform your ability to empathize with your surroundings and I think that's, that's incredibly powerful. Um, and, and, and I will advise that to anyone of any background for that matter. Um, you're honoring that past to continue to create that better future as cheesy or cliche as that sounds, but it's true. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I would advise the younger generations, which I wanna make sure we don't lose in the culture of society is to treasure and absorb almost like a sponge the wisdom of our elders. Mm -hmm. I think 
in, in Latino culture, we have this beautiful thing of, you know, la abuela, el abuelo, and there's this almost this revered, you know, you kind of sit around the table and listen to your stories. Las de mi abuelo, for example, were like, oh my gosh, you, we could listen to him for hours. And I think that is so important. Um, I think our younger generations have the blessing of being digital natives and they may think they know everything because you have access to everything in a click, uh, but not to lose sight of the wisdom of others. I think I was, even though I, I wasn't a digital native, obviously, but I, I was at some point, the younger version of me, too much of a smart ass because you think you know. And now the older version of me is totally opposite. I know how much I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that is pursuing that desire to be surrounded by people smarter and wiser than you. And being okay with that, because that by definition makes you really smart mm -hmm. and, and wise because you acknowledge that. So young people, don't forget where you come from. Surround yourself with people smarter and wiser than you which in many cases comes from the voice of experience of our elders, which may have a lot more, much more context than just quickly Googling an article about how to X, Y, Z. Um, so definitely that. And then um, the other thing, which is almost advice I would give myself is to, you know, not freak out if you don't have it all figured out. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's giving yourself permission to explore options and be open to them, especially when you're young. Like, oh, that offer is not the right money or, oh, I really don't want to move to Seattle or any. Eh. It's like, wait, wait, wait. That is the season in your life when you get to experience and experiment that. And like you said, what's the worst thing that can happen? Oh, I moved to Seattle and I hated it. Fine, then move back to New York. And all of it, Bessie, all of that, the where you come from, the wisdom of others and the flexibility of exploration to me matters and works like magic when it's wrapped with the bow of you're doing all of that because you're playing for something bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. And I know everybody's talking about now inclusion and purpose and purpose-driven business and marketing and conscious capitalism. There's so many labels for it, um, but you got to embody it. This is not somebody's job. Mm -hmm. If all you're doing is chasing money and title, it will leave you unfulfilled. Yeah. yeah. Um, and guess what? When you are chasing the greatness of purpose, and you're really good at it and do the work and study and surround yourself with the wise people, it's probably going to be profitable. So it's, there's not like one excludes the other. Mm -hmm. You can be very successful, generate impact and be blessed with the financials that follow if that's what you want. Mm -hmm. um, when it, it is incurred on a higher calling um, and we all have it. And it doesn't have to be running for office or running a big company like I have. No, it can start with you deliberately knowing you want to help, you know, I don't know, mentor your own cousins. And that already is higher calling. Lily, thank you so much for your time and for your incredible words of wisdom. Gracias a ti.